Abby was at the Washington Post, where she served as a national political reporter. And then prior to joining the Washington Post, you were a digital reporter for politics at ABC News. And you've had such an extensive coverage in covering presidents, leaders, powerful folks. And we've been watching on the sidelines and enjoying every bit of it. Um, I want to dive right on in and let's talk about the election coverage because I think that's where we were glued to the screens on CNN and we noticed you were being on more and more and um, really just want to get some insight as to what that experience was like for you and really, you know, it was kind of a slow victory to calling Biden. Um, what was that like for you? What was that process like for you? And did you get any sleep during that? <laughs> <laughs> Not a whole lot of sleep, but, um, you know, it was actually a really fun week. It was pretty exciting. It was one of those weeks where we truly didn't know where things were going to go for maybe two, two days, maybe a little bit longer than that. And um, so it really kind of stretched all your muscles in terms of, <laughs> analysis and stamina and um and and but I mean I will say I think what made it fun was that it was effectively especially when it was me and Dana uh Dana Bash and Jake Tapper all together kind of on the same um in, in the same studio it was like having a conversation with friends about politics. And so it really, and the, the time passed. I mean, obviously by day four, I was like, look, we need to get an answer to this right now. Cause I mean, not you home at all? Or we, I mean, were you practically living there? I, I mean, we're living there. I mean, I came home literally to take a shower and to go to bed for however long I could go to bed. And I would get, I would, I would come home. Usually it was, sometime after midnight. So the first night we went home around 3.30 a.m. The second night it was around one. So, you know, I would go home and I would immediately go to sleep. Like I'd say, my, for some reason, my husband decided to stay up a lot of those nights. So I would like say hello to him, say goodnight to him, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, grab my bag and head out the door like <laughs> that was it no breakfast no coffee just like get out the door so i mean it was it was just relentless it was non-stop but um i mean that's the that's the ball game like this is what we all kind of do this thing for so it was fun like were you getting five hours of sleep or were you getting like two hours it just depended on the night. So the first night I got like two hours. I mean, oh we, um, I mean, we went, we left at three 30 and, but then we, they, we, they were sort of like, well, keep your phone on because we might call you at any time. And that's kind of how, what it was like the rest of the time. It was always like, you can go home, but keep your phone on because if we need you, we'll call you. And so you could never really trust that you had as much time to sleep as maybe you thought that you did. Um, there was one day, I think this might've been Thursday, that they had us come in early and like super early, like seven, after we had left at like one in the morning or two. And so for me and Dana, that meant we had to be there by like 5.30 a.m. Oh so we got like four hours of sleep maybe. And then they, we went most of the day and then they were like, okay, you can take a break for three hours or two hours or whatever it was, but don't leave the building. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> the building. so I literally, I was like, I don't have a couch in my office. So I wandered around on my floor to see who, which of my colleagues had a couch in their office. Turned out Nia Malika Henderson had a couch. So I text, texted Nia. I was like, Nia, are you coming in today? Like, can I take a nap on your sofa? <laughs> my God. Did you let you? Yeah. I mean, I literally, I grabbed, like, I had, like, a sweater in my office, and I, like, draped it across myself, and I just took a nap. <laughs> and then we went back. How did you even get snacks around here? I mean, were you, like, ordering in? Were you just, I mean, they, what so they had food 
for, yeah. for the most part. Um, but sometimes it was like we would be the last people to eat because we're stuck on set. So we can't leave when the food arrives. We can only leave when we have a good opportunity. So sometimes we would miss the food altogether. There were a couple of times that Dana ordered food. We, we had sushi one day and like, I mean, I ate every meal for an entire week on that set. Breakfast, okay. lunch, and dinner on the set. Just sitting there like, you know, I would have whatever it was on the side. And usually it was like cold because we, you know, we can't, we can eat when we have a chance to eat, not when the food is hot. So, so back to kind of covering, how did you get your information in real time? I mean, the new, everything was constantly changing around election time. And for those of who are, you, who are just joining us, we're talking about Abby's experience covering the 2020 presidential election on CNN. And so give us an insight as to like, information was constantly changing. We don't know what to believe necessarily as the viewer. How are you getting your information? Well, this is a little, a little bit of insight into CNN's kind of operation is that we have some really nice resources that help us stay on top of like the latest information. So we have a whole dashboard that has kind of like the raw data that goes into all the graphics that you see on the screen, all the magic wall stuff that John King does. So the 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 votes and the information that that gets plugged into those things that show up for the audience, we can see it on our laptop. So I always had my laptop open and I always had, um, you know, it would, it would have like all, all the key races, what the vote count was, what percent of the vote was early vote versus um, day of vote, because it was such an important, I mean, th this election more than any other, the data was so important and understanding what you were looking at. You, it's hard to do analysis if you don't know, okay, am I looking at only early vote or am I looking at only day of vote? And so having that information at my fingertips was really important. And that was like our lifeline, essentially. That's how I kept tabs on everything from Senate races to the presidential race. I had all my maps up, like my 2016 map, my 2020 map. I mean, I've, I've said this before, but I'm like kind of a data nerd and I rather would have more data than less data. And then I also, you know, I follow certain people on social media who I know are like diving into congressional races. And then I had like, you know, sources and on the Democratic side and on the Republican side that I'm texting with. So just trying to keep the flow of information all night was the only way really to get through that. I can only imagine you had to be locked in and focused. You did not have time for any outside distractions. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, you're widely praised for representing with class and professionalism on air. How are you able to separate your personal views and your political opinions? Well, you know, I don't really think about it all that much. And maybe it's because I've been doing this as a journalist for a long time, I mean, look, we all have personal views about things. I mean, we're not robots. So it's not like we're coming into the, we're, we're not coming into the business just pretending as if we're not human beings and we have perspectives that we bring to the table. But I also just try to apply, um, you know, as many facts as we can, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's data or historical precedent or, you know, just knowing that, um, that so much of analysis, especially in political journalism, is about recognizing patterns, identifying it for the audience and explaining it to the audience. And so I try to do that and rely on that. And sometimes it might seem that like, when you make a sort of clear statement about something that's happening, that you're injecting your opinion, but sometimes it's important just to be clear about what the facts are. And, um, and sometimes the facts are different from what people want to believe and what people are saying, and you have to be clear about that. So I just try to um, 
be straightforward with people about what I believe the evidence shows about a certain situation. And that is a little subjective, but um, you know, it's not about how I feel about something. It's about what I see happening in the world, what I am hearing from people that I'm talking to and how um, that applies to the situation that we're in. I don't consider that to be my personal feelings. That's, that's applying um, my knowledge to a situation. And I think we all do that from different, from different points of view. That's what makes us all unique. But, um, you know, to me, it's, it's how I feel about something. It doesn't really matter. What matters is, um, what matters is what am I observing as a reporter, um, in my reporting and in the pattern of facts that have been laid out by, um, the things that have happened in the world and how can I explain that to people in a clear way? Absolutely. I mean, I think why so many people have resonated with you is your style of reporting, which is factual, calming, but the way that you deliver the information is done in a way that's not really aggressive, but in a way that we can listen, we can absorb, and we can understand. Has your style of reporting changed since you first started um, journalism and broke into this industry? Probably. I mean, uh, we all grow, right? And I, I definitely think, I mean, even looking back three years ago when I first started at CNN, and I was very new to television and very new to um, this type of delivery of information, which is very different. I mean, I had appeared on TV as a, um, you know, as a commentator when I worked at the Washington Post, when I worked at Politico. So I, I, I had experience doing that. But I think one of the things that being a correspondent at a television network teaches you is um, is organ the organization of the delivery of your information, helping people follow along with you. And uh, I think I, I've grown in that way. And it's one of the um, things that I'm continuing to work on. And I think all broadcasters work on that because you might have all kinds of thoughts in your mind and you might be able to articulate it on paper really, really well and very clearly, especially if you've had a couple of chances to review it and to read it over and to edit it. But when you're on TV and you're live, you don't get to edit yourself. You have to deliver it the way you want it to come out. And one thing that I try to do is not be um, pushed into uh, you know, trying to be overly dramatic on TV or overly, um, you know, hyperbolic or speaking in a way that is loud or too fast. It's just not me. There's nothing wrong with those things. It's just that it's just not who I am as a person. And the most authentic way to communicate with people in the way that they understand you and that they're with you is to just try to be as much of your authentic self as you can. And that's actually a process, you know? I think that the hardest thing to do is to find who you are as a person delivering information when a camera is pointed at you. And um, I didn't realize that at first when I first started, but it's something that you learn very quickly that it's actually what you're trying to do is not be like, um, you know, the stereotypical like newscaster, like newsman or newswoman. You're just trying to be like Abby Phillip or Lauren Wesley Wilson and whoever that person is so that who you feel inside is who comes across to other people who are watching you. Otherwise, it's you're kind of acting and putting on this show that it's really exactly. bound you to maintain for a while. So staying true to yourself and your authentic self is key. What, do you, what are some strategies that you can share that you used to improve and, and become better. I know so many people on the line have been commentators at various networks or speak on panels or, or do public speaking. And what are some ways that you, you know, exercise to improve yourself? Well, um, just a little bit of, um, of like honesty with, the, with this audience. You know, I hate watching myself on <laughs> TV, I hate it. Like it gives me a lot of anxiety still, even really? now. I mean, they're so natural. <laughs> no, I absolutely like, no, I will leave. The, if I see myself on television, I will leave the room. Like I do not <laughs> want to watch. But that being said, early on, 
you know, we one of the things that happened at CNN was that I they they have performance coaches, oh, and wow. yeah, so you know, I worked with a couple of people actually on my performance, and um, it's very you know, <laughs> it's a little bit kind of like loosey goosey, kind of like artsy, but the point of it is honestly just to get you to watch yourself critically, but not too critically. I mean, the point is really to find one thing about what you're doing that you want to improve on. And don't try to improve on too many things at once because then you'll get in your head. But just pick one thing, try it one time and keep working on it. And then when you feel like, when it feels like second nature, you can move on to something else. And that's kind of how we worked on things over the years. And it made a really big difference. It forced me to do things I didn't want to do specifically looking at my, my clips and saying to myself, okay, that was pretty good, but here's the thing I want to do differently. And then the other thing I would say is I always urge people to do this in any kind of public speaking, whether you're appearing on television or giving a speech or, you know, talking on a panel or what have you, you're talking to another person. You know, it might be like a hundred other people or 500 other people, but you're talking to someone. And it's really important to always think about how you communicate in the way that you would think about talking to your friend, especially if you're trying to explain something or trying to convey something that is complex. How would you explain this to your girlfriend at dinner if she asked you about it? And I, I often think about that when, huh? Simplify what you're saying. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Like, make it simple, you know, making it yeah. in, in plain English almost sometimes. In plain English, exactly. And, and, you know, don't take yourself too seriously because people are not impressed by how um, official you sound. They just want to understand you. And so I just try to keep it. I try to keep it straightforward for me, but like what's straightforward for me is different from what's straightforward for you. But it's like how I would explain it to my friend or my mom or my sister or my brother or whatever. And I try to keep that lens about it because it's more interesting to people when they feel like they're talking to a real person and not hearing somebody like recite things to them. Absolutely. Let's transition to, um, back to the election coverage. I know something that went viral with with what you had shared was about how black women put the president, Joe Biden, as president and and the first vice president as a black woman and saying that we did that, we made that happen. Um, explain to us and those people who are on the line what exactly that means. I think we, you know, many of us know, but I've gotten some questions from people who weren't black and who have asked, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. And, um, you know, how does that moment feel to you? Um, as a black woman, as a as a immigrant, a first generation immigrant, what, how did that feel to you? Well, you know, um, in that moment, I had been thinking, you know, because we, we were we knew that we we were coming up on the moment when this was going to happen, and we were they were they were sort of like you know get your thoughts together, get your thoughts together, and I, I in that moment I was thinking not just about Joe Biden or even about Kamala Harris, but just about the long history. Of black women in this country and the role that um, we have played in um, being a source of moral clarity for the entire nation, you know, for a very long time. And um, just thinking about that kind of when you when you start thinking about the ways in which black women have sort of held things down for so long and, um, you know, been at the forefront of the civil rights movement and been at the forefront of all of these, diff at the, of the women's rights rights movement. And they don't often don't even get credit for the role that they play in those efforts. And I think what has been extraordinary to watch as a political journalist, but also as a black woman, especially in 2020, is seeing that power being recognized and coming to the forefront of the conversation where you see with uh, with clarity that black women in particular um have been unwavering in 
um, their rejection of President Trump and their support for not just Democrats, but knowing early on which Democratic candidate they wanted to get behind. And I think that that kind of clarity um, is, I think, notable because um, it, it has allowed Black women to play such a powerful force in our politics. And it deserves to be recognized. Now, look, you may, if you're a Republican, you may just disagree, obviously, with the role that they played in, um, in, in voting by and large for Democrats or in voting for Joe Biden. But, um, but it's notable nonetheless that, um, you know, while you see movement with Black men, you see movement with Hispanic men and Hispanic women and, and white women, um, you know, going back and forth along the political spectrum, you know, there's a sort of resolute nature to what Black women did in this cycle in particular that I thought deserved to be called out. But I think also, you know, with Kamala Harris rising to this role, that's a moment for this country, regardless of your part partisan affiliation. And, um, and I, and I worried, actually, honestly, I felt that it would be um, a disservice if we didn't mark that moment, despite all the craziness that was going on and how partisan everything seemed to be, you know, just like when Obama was, um, was elected, and people were able to take a step back and say, this is an important moment for the United States of America. I thought it was important to be able to say a black and a South Asian woman becoming the next vice president of the United States. That's an important moment for this country. And we've got to recognize it, um, recognize what that means in terms of progress. Absolutely. And, and recognize the group who was instrumental in helping us get there. Um, what do we think happened? I really want to know your opinion to Black men um, voting for Trump. I know there are stats that had shared that 20% of Black men voted for Trump. Do you believe that? Is that true? And, you know, how was he able to appeal to that base is what I'm looking for. Well, I definitely um, believe that he's had a much, uh, much easier time making inroads with Black men. Um, over the last four years. And um, it's something that I've actually talked to a lot of people about, a lot of Democrats, a lot of Republicans. I think one of the factors is that men in general tend to be more amenable to President Trump's message and his style. I think his style is very appealing to a lot of men, regardless of, of race. Um, and, uh, and, Interestingly, I mean, I find anecdotally that a lot of people tell me that younger Black men in particular seem to be more interested in Trump's message. And I don't really have a good explanation for that, to be honest. Like, I, I, I don't think there's anything really concrete about what is behind that. The only thing I can gather from my reporting and from what I hear from people and hear from those people is that there's less of a fixation about his style of governance. There's a feeling that um, some of the things that a lot of Democrats find to be offensive about Trump, whether it's his policy or his style, but I think if you look at policy, um, when you look at the immigration rhetoric and the immigration moves um, and the economic policy, you find that more Black men than Black women and more men in general than women um, don't mind those policies. They don't mind the rhetoric. And, um, and they feel like the prospect of economic advantages as a result of Trump's policies are better for them than being hung up on some of the other stuff. That's what I hear from people. Um, but I think it's hard to know because even at 20%, if, if it is 20%, it's not a huge sample size. And I think it's all very anecdotal, but you just see a lot more people are so much more receptive to his message because they're saying, I like that he is willing to say whatever he thinks. I, I don't mind that he's tough. And I, and I hate that you're trying to force me and him to be politically correct. And <laughs> I, I know following the rules and kind of just saying yeah. on what comes to mind. Yes. It's resonating apparently. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, 
that's obviously that there are still, you know, millions and millions and millions of supporters out there for him. So I'm really interested to see what happens with those supporters and what they do and everything along those lines. I mean, what do, where, what do they do now? What do they get behind? Do you have any answers to that? <laughs> well, you know, I don't think he's going anywhere. And, I, and certainly Trumpism isn't going anywhere. And, um, and I think that there, this is the movement now on the Republican side. It is going to be candidates who are like Trump, maybe not necessarily exactly like him in his style, but you'll see them having the same kinds of policy positions. You know, I just before the election, I was talking to a Republican who was, you know, saying to me that he thought that the model for the future of this sort of Trumpy movement is actually someone like John James in Michigan, someone who can kind of run on the as run on a sort of Trump light platform, but is a person of color and kind of appeals to um, you know more people of color, but with the same kind of platform as Trump, but without some of the baggage. And I think that's where I think you're going to see a lot of Republicans heading toward um, <laughs> candidates who are basically for the same things, but with less baggage than Trump. Well, let's, um, I guess I think we could take a break from the election coverage and dive a little bit more into you. And I know that we're receiving some questions in the chat box, um, but some folks are wondering, what is like the day in the life of what you do right now as an on-air correspondent? What does your schedule and your day look like? Um, you know, we know you're on television, but just kind of run us through that. Yeah, I mean, well, right now, I mean, things are super hectic, but I mean, I would day to day, everything is always a little bit different. But I mean, I would say like almost every day, um, you know, my day starts between 6.30 and 7. I'm kind of uh, responding to emails, getting on calls. Um, you know, getting requests for hits. And, um, you know, I kind of start whenever the first request comes in, and I usually don't know when that is until the day of. So it's very, <laughs> it's very hard to, like, plan things because most of my day is a little bit up in the air until it happens. Yeah, and well, are you on Monday through Friday, or do we work on the weekends? I mean, most days, most weeks, unless there's something big going on, it's Monday through Friday. You know, the weeks leading up to the election, we were working pretty much seven days a week. But when it's not kind of like the, the height of the election season, I do try to unplug on the weekends. It's like the one time that I try to unplug. But during the week, you know, my days are like 12 hours, 14 hours minimum. Um, and, you know, on days that I start on our early show, New Day, which is from six to eight, six to nine, um, you know, I don't, I try not to do this as much anymore, but if I do like a 6 a.m. hit, you know, I probably need to get up at like 4.30 or, or earlier, depending on when I need to go in for hair and makeup and then get ready to be on right at six. Um, these days I've been trying to push it closer to, a seven o'clock start because my days are kind of ending a lot later now. But, you know, because I'm kind of on call all the time, one thing that I try to do to like get a little bit of life stuff in is that between hits, so even if I come in, let's say I come in to do my first hit at seven, I'll go home I'll after that and I'll go and make myself a pot of coffee and like, work from home for a couple of hours and then go back to the office because if I don't do that I'll be at the office for 12 or 14 hours and it's sort of crazy so you know I do try to like fit in my life where I can here and there in the the hours between my hits and just try to make it work that way but I mean it, it's the thing about tv it, and I tell this to people who there I, I, a lot of people are like how do I, you know, what should I know about coming into TV? And I'm like, the thing to know is that you have limited control over your life. <laughs> you know, you're just kind of like, you're a little bit at the mercy. Strong call. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're kind of at the mercy of the news cycle. And especially if you're in the role that I'm in, where 
you know, literally anything can happen on any topic and you'll get a call to be on television. Um, you can't, you have to just recognize that your time is not really your own and you have to try to be strategic and creative about how you fill in the gaps so that you can actually get your life stuff done while also working pretty much all the time. And before, recently we've gotten hair and makeup back at CNN, but during COVID, you know, I'm like, I would be like in my office, like curling my hair and trying to like be on the phone with people. So like, you know, you just have to like really multitask and try to get everything in. And I really got my, you know, when I was doing it myself, I got my hair and makeup down to like 30, 35 minutes. You know, so I could squeeze as much in as possible. I mean, so when it comes to your personal life, because you are work-wise seem to be very on call and, and not really in control, um, when do you find time? And like, what do you do on your off hours? Do you go to the gym? Do you go to brunch? <laughs> well, you know, okay. So my husband and I broke down and we got a Peloton during, um, during COVID. Which was, which was a good decision. I mean, I still don't ride as much as I should. Yeah. Because, you know, when, when you're doing 12 or 14 hour days, it's, it's like, it's a trade off. Like, do I sleep or do I work out? And, and especially in my position where I'm like, like, I think if I were sort of working a normal job, I could slip in a workout at lunch, but because I'm in hair and makeup from five in the morning until nine at night, I can't really do that as much. So it's not as often as I would like. I try to do it on the weekends. I try to do it on days that I'm lucky enough to know that I don't have hits until later in the morning. Um, you know, I mean, I think in general, like I, I'm lucky to have a good husband who fills in a lot of the gaps in our lives, like because things are so busy and he works from home and has a pretty flexible situation so he takes he helps take care of the dog and you know like especially these days figures out dinner and and you know we split up tasks like I'll go to the grocery store on my way home from work and he'll get dinner started so you know you just I mean ult ultimately you could have a whole conversation about you know figuring out your personal life when you have a very busy job but I mean I think the key in general is to make sure that your partner is a partner and is supportive <laughs> and if they have a flexibility that's even better but um i mean i know that i definitely couldn't do I, I it would be difficult to do all of this without kind of like having someone who's understanding about the fact that you know well i'll come home from dinner i'll come home from work between my six o'clock hit and my eight o'clock hit and we'll try to squeeze in dinner in that time and then I'll go back to work. And then I'll come home. Dinner during this time? Or you guys are ordering out? <laughs> we, we, we try to cook dinner when we can. We order out, you know, yeah. maybe like actually it could be like as much as half the time. Um, but like sometimes we cook dinner. Like sometimes I cook dinner because I like cooking. And it's like a thing that I enjoy doing that generally relaxes me. So sometimes I will want to cook dinner, especially when I was traveling all the time. And yeah. I was only eating out. I would come home and I'd be like, I need to have a home cooked meal. Um, and then we'll watch Brock. <laughs> like we'll, we'll sit on the couch and we'll watch junk TV. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I can only really imagine work-life balance becoming even more challenging in the type of career that you have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna switch back because I know I'm seeing some, a lot of questions about representation yeah. and folks are wanting to know, you know have you been in an experience where you felt like there was like a lack of diversity? And I, and I know it's hard to maybe call out where you currently work if you feel the case, but maybe in your previous jobs. And how did you like advocate for yourself in those positions? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I have definitely felt a lack of diversity. And I like to be straightforward when people ask me this question, because it's no secret that political journalism is not one where there are a lot of Black women working in national politics. It's just not the case. And when I first started in um, covering politics, I was working at Politico. And for a long time, I was the only black reporter in the entire, uh, on, the on the news side of the newsroom. Um, and 
I, I remember that time distinctly because it is extremely isolating. And, um, and then I, and at that time, even more so, there, there were so few people my age who looked like me, who were working in national politics. There, there was a sort of lack of um, companionship in terms of people going through the same things that you were. And, um, you know, not as many mentors as, you know, you might otherwise want there to be. It, it can feel, um, there were definitely times where I felt like this is not gonna work for me because I'm trying to make it in an industry where my sources are mostly white men and um, the people, you know, who have the, the scoops that my news organization care about are mostly white men. And they don't wanna to talk to, to someone like me because they don't have anything, they don't feel like they have anything in common with me. And they're, you know, the conversations with me are more awkward because they, you know, they're kind of like, oh, how do I talk to this black woman? You know, that you, you, you've got that sense from people a lot. Um, and I still do, you know, you still often encounter, you know, one of the things that you see all the time is that, I would like notice that my, you know, white male colleagues would be going out and getting drinks with, um, you know, le leadership office staffers and, and, you know, hanging out at baseball games. And, it, and, and those things were always things that never seemed available to me um, because of who I was largely. And so figuring out my way in the industry in spite of that was a journey, obviously, but it's a real problem to this day. I mean, I think in TV, it's on a whole other level where you have some examples of diversity, but not nearly enough. I think we can all agree at all the networks, there is not nearly enough. And I look forward to that changing. And I'm lucky that I feel like, you know, my career is on a good track and I feel, I feel good about where I work. I feel supported where I work. Um, but I also think constantly about the pipeline. Absolutely. About whether the pipeline even exists for people like me. I don't want to be a unicorn in this industry, you know? And so I think there's a lot of work to be done to identify the rooms that we're not in and the opportunities that we don't get access to. And um, I think about that every day. I think it's, it's, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges and one of the most embarrassing things I think for the news industry is the way in which we are still broken in terms of true diversity and representation from the bottom all the way to the top. And so it needs to be fixed, but hopefully I can be in a position now and later on in my career where I can have a positive impact on that. Absolutely, I mean, we've seen such, you know, fantastic news lately with Rashida Jones becoming the president of MSNBC, replacing Phil Griffin. And yeah. she's only 39 years old, which is so fantastic. And Joy Reid's new show, um, Late Night, and she made history there. And, you know, you're, you're making history on your own as well. What are some, you know, we learned that, and we talk about this all the time at ColorCom, that it's not enough just to do your job well. It's not enough just to do great work. What are some things and some strategies that you think that you have to do behind the scenes that people don't see to advance yourself in the workplace? I think that you have to build relationships, obviously, and manage up and manage down. And I think most people in a professional setting, they figure this out one way or another, but it's not just about whether you do your job or how well you do your job. It's also about understanding how to communicate with your superiors, how to be clear about what you need, what you want, um, how you're trying to solve a problem for them while also holding them accountable for your career as well. And, you know, I think learning how to take ownership of my own career has been a process. And, um, you know, I used to kind of sit in silence and just be like, okay, I got to put my head down and do my job and just like sit here and do these stories. And I don't want to like get, in, get into conversations with my editors about 
what opportunities I want, what I, you know, but, but you really have to, to, um, if you level with your superiors in a clear and respectful way, you might be surprised to find that they're willing to meet you halfway or more than halfway in some cases. And, um, and that's about managing up. It's about maintaining those relationships, not in an oppressive way, because some people can, you know, you don't want to be like pestering your boss all the time, but when you do reach out to them, they, they need to know that it's because you have something to say and that you want to communicate something to them and um, that you're going to have an adult relationship with them, not one of fear, but one of um, a reciprocal relationship. And when you think about also managing down, yeah. you want to think about who's around you to support you. Um, and these might be people who work for you or do things for you or people who um, are part of your support system and creating like a kind of cushion for yourself um, among your peers and among people who are less senior than you is part of the process as well. Obviously have a lot of mentors. I've had some really influential mentors, people who um, through no, um, no effort of my own have taken it upon themselves to be helpful to me. And um, again, I, I come back to kind of like those relationships. What's that? Can you share with who some of your mentors are? Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. I mean, and I've said this publicly, you know, Nia Malika Henderson, who's my colleague at CNN, she has helped me um, get almost every job that I've had in the journalism business. I've known her since I was a brand new reporter at Politico and we met in like the ladies bathroom one day. <laughs> and, um, and so pe people like Nia, she's always like looking out, right? And I can, I know I can always go to her. If I have a question about like, who do I talk to about this? I'm so frustrated with this. Who should I go to? How should I handle this? Should I even do this thing? Um, you know, those are the kinds of questions that we work through. But the thing about a mentoring relationship, and I think people really need to understand this, is that you can't force somebody to be your mentor, okay? Like, you have to allow that relationship to grow in an organic way and communicate without the expectation of receiving something from the other person. And, um, and as your relationship develops, it will deepen. And I think that that's kind of how my relationship with Nia started where we didn't really have a mentoring relationship. We were just people who knew each other. And, uh, but over the years, we've grown a lot closer as she's helped me navigate a lot of tough situations. People like Kevin Merida, when I was at the Washington Post, he was a managing editor at the Post and he was incredibly influential in me going to the campaign trail and going on, getting on the, the White House team and really pushing for me in the, the rooms where people were making decisions about what I was gonna be doing. And the reason I think Kevin was able to play that role for me was because uh, of that managing up thing that I was talking about where you, I was very direct with Kevin. I said to him, this is what I want to do and this is why. And understanding that he was able to take that with him into those rooms and say, this is why we need to put Abby in this job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you communicate effectively- serving, you know, What we talk about at Colorcom, he was essentially serving as a sponsor for you because he was advocating for you when you weren't in the room, but he was having some clear ideas to what you wanted to do. I mean, and I yes. think we oftentimes think that our bosses should know or people should know what we want to do. This is why we're here. This is why we're trying to achieve. But if we don't vocalize it, how can we- Get what we want. And it's not always a, hey, Kevin, can you do this? Right? I don't think I ever asked Kevin, hey, can you do this for me? I, yeah. We just had a conversation about what my goals were, what I wanted, and what I was going to push for. And when he was in the room, it was up to him whether he was going to play the for, you. for me. And yeah. he did. And so, so I, again, I think like you just have to be mindful that people don't want to be like assigned tasks by you, especially not your mentors. And I want to go back to that, actually. I want to go back to mentorship. Um, really, frankly, because actually January is mentorship month and Colorcom, we're doing this 
formal mentorship training program with our board. So if you're a member on the line and you haven't applied, please look out for it because we have some amazing women who are going to do a formal mentorship training with our member base. But I want to go back to it from like a professional standpoint because we talk about it so often. And I think people are making mentorship a little bit harder. They're making it hard. And then they're making the process of finding one really challenging, right? So we're asking people, will you be my mentor? We're now assigning these homework assignments of like monthly calls and monthly check-ins. And what mentorship really is, it's about getting advice from someone who's walked the path and the journey before. And that really is as simple as making an effort to reach out to someone, schedule 15 minutes, you know, maybe a phone call just to say, you know, can we have a conversation about X? This is what um, I'm looking to seek your advice on because people are so willing to give up their advice, to give their knowledge for free, especially if you make it easy for them. But I think to your point, what you said earlier, it's not necessarily assigning more work or like tapping someone on the shoulder and saying, will you be my mentor? And I think we need to simplify that process to make it a little bit more easier for people so you can advance in the workplace. Yeah, I, I think that you don't need to, you know, I, I don't, I've never had a conversation with someone who I have had a mentorship relationship where I was like, will you be my mentor? And maybe some people do that, but I've never done that. And I think that you have to understand that relationships, as I said before, develop over time. And the way that you start a relationship is ought to be as easy and as straightforward as possible in which you're very clear with them, especially with busy people, about what you want to accomplish from the conversation. And it can be something really, you know, less is more. So like you have something that you're facing, you know, a very specific thing and you need one piece of advice. Just keep it simple. It doesn't have to be a profound conversation about your whole career or anything like that. Just whatever this one thing is that you're facing, and that you need guidance on. Just let it be that one thing. And that way, you know, you can keep it brief and you can build, it's, it's a process. And, um, you know, I think just trying to um, also just not, you don't have to solve all of your career problems in your first or your second conversation with your mentor. And then you also don't need to think of mentors only as people who are, much, much older than you or much, much senior than you. Sometimes your mentors can be people who are actually your peers, but maybe they've gone through what you're going through just a little bit before you. And um, sometimes those relationships can actually grow into um, more significant mentorship relationships than you might originally expect. So I would also, you know, open up your aperture to think about who can be a mentor to you, not just people who are like like yeah I would love for Oprah to be my mentor but um maybe maybe not Oprah but maybe it's Yamish Alcindor who's a friend of mine and who I often go to for guidance and for help and for support so sometimes it's people who you are like right there with you and maybe yeah. they've done the thing that you want to do just before you're doing it and I think too, I mean, think of it as like a board of advisors for your career. You don't have to just focus and narrow in on one. When I was young in my twenties, I used to think I just needed, you know, mentor was singular. And I was focused in on this person with this senior vice president title. And I really thought she had to be my mentor because she was doing amazing things. And we met and there really wasn't chemistry professionally. And so, you know, moved on, but I was so like narrowed in on like, landing this coffee with this one person and thinking about it to your point is mentorship is really could be 360 it could you can learn from people who you know who done it just right a step up or a little bit faster or even below I mean there's things that you know people who are younger than you can teach you and it doesn't always have to be all the way to the top but thinking about it as kind of a, a collective group of people because really what it comes down to is information right how do I have the information and the skills to advance? And people who've done different things have the information that you need. So, absolutely. And so, going back to mentorship, who do you mentor? Who are you? How are you helping the next generation of leaders? That's one of the questions. Well, I get a lot of, um, I I get a lot of like 
calls and emails from people at CNN, but also people who are not at CNN. I'm not going to name names, but just um, colleagues, actually, honestly, who might be at other news organizations, and they'll they'll say like, "Hey, Abby, you know, how do I go from print to TV? Should I go from print to TV? Should I, you know?" How do I na navigate, you know, this situation? Should I go on the campaign trail? Should I, you know, stick with writing? You know, what steps should I take? So there are a lot of people who are not even that much younger than me, to be honest, like just a couple of years. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Like, you know, you the way that you think about mentorship relationships have to be kind of you have to kind of put it into a different perspective because some of these people are maybe my age or maybe just a year or two younger than me who are just in different phases in their careers. And, um, you know, I try to do two things. Like I give as straightforward advice as I can about my experience and about how that can inform their experience. And then I try to act on it. And, you know, the things that people have done for me, like making calls to hiring managers and sending emails on their behalf and, you know, helping set up meetings. I try to do that as much as I can for people who want my help, you know? And, um, you know, I mean, I will say, actually, this is a good point to um, make about the mentorship point, you know, I think it's important that if you're going to ask somebody to make a call on your behalf or to to put in a good word for you, that you have enough of a relationship that they can genuinely vouch for you and that they can really attest to who you are. Um, and so that that interaction that they have with the person who may hire you is as genuine as possible. And it's easy, it has been easy for me to do that with the people who I've done that for. But I've also had people ask me to do that when I don't know them at all. And it's hard for me to give that recommendation because we don't have a relationship. And so I would urge people to think about that and think about making sure that you build a relationship of some kind before you ask somebody to vouch for you because it's going to be hard for them to do it in an authentic way if they don't really know you or can't really say anything about your work. So I've, I've been lucky that I've been, every time that I've done that for someone else, it hasn't always worked, right? Like, so sometimes you put in a good word and it doesn't work out for somebody for whatever reason. But I always urge people, like I'll say like, look, it doesn't hurt for me to put you in somebody's mind because maybe it doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah, like maybe it doesn't work out right now, but maybe two years down the road it does. And yeah. so, yeah. So as we wrap up, we just have a few quick questions, um, you know, just trying to get some quick answers. What is one thing you wish you would have known at the start of your career that you know now? Uh, that you're, uh, you're as smart as most of these other people. <laughs> I think if I had known that early on, um, I would have been less intimidated by people who I perceived to be more senior or more experienced than I was at an earlier age. Okay, that's good to know. So I think that it goes with don't doubt yourself. I think that, that is, yes. It's not about me specifically. I'm just saying more than likely you're qualified and smart enough to be where you are. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing that. That's good information. So one person has says, you, we have known you have rocked for years. Are you overwhelmed with your newfound fame? <laughs> yes <laughs> you are <laughs> it's, um, yeah it's busy I, that's yeah as we've discussed earlier it's very hectic right now it's a little overwhelming but it's it's still pretty fun okay so quickly you know we have people on the line who might want to get a hold of you who might want to have you speak at their companies what is the process how do we get a hold of you what do you recommend if we want you to speak and etc well, the easiest way is to um, go to our speaker request form. It's cnn.com slash speakers. And um, it seems like a really impersonal form. It's not very long, but it's actually a really important first step 
for me to be able to consider any speaking engagements because it has to be approved by CNN. But if you fill out that form, that's the best way to get that process started. It comes to me, it comes to my PR, my publicist, and then it goes through the process. So I would strongly recommend starting there and not necessarily emailing me directly because sometimes I miss the emails because my inbox is a complete disaster right now. <laughs> so the, the easiest way to make sure it gets to multiple people so that it doesn't fall through the cracks is to do that. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And just want to end with one last question, which I keep seeing. So we're going to answer it. We're going to ask it. Um, what is your career goals? Where do you see yourself? What's next? Um, you've done such amazing job so far. We're such huge fans of your work, but what can we expect? <laughs> what do you, what do you want to achieve? Yeah, well, that's a tough question. I mean, I would say like, I love what I'm doing right now in the sense that I love playing a role in these big moments at CNN, I'd love to do more of that. Um, you know, being behind the anchor desk more is always like, a, has been a really good um, growth place for me. I mean, as somebody who was a print reporter three years ago, it's a totally different um, universe, but it's been, um, it's been a good opportunity for me to be able to be, uh, to tell the stories that I actually wanna tell. And so I think going into this next year, especially, especially since we're coming off a presidential year, I wanna be doing a lot more storytelling. I wanna to continue to be a part of these big moments for this network and just continue to have a presence. Maybe think, one day you might be hosting, we don't yeah, know. Maybe one, yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> Group for you on that one, we couldn't wait. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanna thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are, I know that You've been asked to do a lot of things. And so just thank you so much for spending your time with us at Colorcom and for our community, our members to get to know you and letting us know how we can get in touch with you. And um, we wish you nothing but the best. And we are gonna continue to watch you and support you and root for you. And thank you so much for your time. I so, so appreciate it. Oh, and quick, quick plug for Colorcom as we wrap up. Um, if you are not a member, we are offering uh, discount today. We are waiving the initiation fee for those who have signed up today to listen to Abby Phillip. So please, please, please sign up. We're waiving and honoring $150 off. So it'll just be two ten a year. And then you can follow us. I know that we were tweeting the conversation on Colorcom Network on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. We're all Colorcom. So join the movement. And thank you, Abby. Hope to see you soon. It's been far too long. I hope to see you live. So much fun. Thank you for having me. And thank you for everybody listening to us for a whole hour. It was a really fun conversation. It was really great. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye.